think uh, a lot of us have, uh, like juniors and seniors have already had internships by now or co-ops. Uh, and Career Services recently just emailed me and I think a lot of us assume that when you get your internship or co-op that you know, they already know about it. Um, and you know, the either the companies tell them or like there's some, you know, some wizard who like says, oh, by the way, you know, Daniel got an internship and so they, they can mark it in their Excel spreadsheet. Um, but they just informed me recently that that's not what happens. You have to actually register, or not register, but you know, tell them that you got an internship. Can you do that on Handshake? Uh, if there, you just say, I have an experience. And you have to put those guys in. Uh, and that'll help, so like if you on your Handshake page, um, employers can see that so they can see what, what kind of stuff you've done before. Um, and it also helps because all the other engineering majors are meeting computer science because they know about this, and so they put in all their internships. Um, and so people just assume that computer science people don't get it. Um, so if you do get an internship either next summer or you had one previously, um, put that experience in. <coughs> also, we have um, one more open slot uh, in November. I think it's November 20th for um, a student talk. It'll, it would be the last student talk um, for the semester. If you have something you wanted to you know, give a talk on, if you had a topic or you already did a really cool presentation in class that everybody liked and you just wanted to share it with um, general computer science, Message me in the Slack. And or me. Or Monty. Just or Ramdev. Just put in the Ramdev channel that you want to give a talk to. Or Monty, yeah. Yeah. And this is the attendance. Uh, it's kind of small. It's in the Slack. If you uh, oh, go to the Ramdev channel, it's there. It'll help us order pizza next time. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Andre. Cool. Thanks, John. Hey guys, my name is Andre. Uh, looking around, I see a few familiar faces. Uh, the one that everyone watches is the Google Crowd Club here. So everyone's new, welcome. Uh, I'm a senior in computer science, and uh, today I'm talking about machine translation. So one specific thing, talking guys about the paradigm and framework that Google Translate actually embraced in about 2015 uh, to actually actually move all their translation services. And I'll talk about more. Right. So not in terms of actual implementation, because that's its own bag of can of worms. So the actual uh, theoretical framework that it sits on, and this is actually uh, the version of Deep Learning. So uh, a little bit of my background, so I'm a fourth year CS student, third year math student. Uh, I have interests in language processing and machine learning. Uh, I've been working here in a few research labs for the past uh, four years, and I've gotten a lot of great mentorship and guidance from uh, Dr. Richard McKinnis. Dr. Gorka Kranter, also the core corner over there. Um, so we did some language processing and then stuff with uh, uh, with actual uh, So uh, yeah, this is a cool one, case uh, from like from a couple years ago. So kind of to get started out, what are we actually you know, what are we doing here? Uh, this is gonna be a mid-level talk on the machine learning, machine learning powering language translation systems. Uh, an excursion, right? Excursion is that word. With the sequence of deep learning models and current neural networks uh, towards an interesting problem and actually just talking. So the actual techniques I'm talking about are applicable to any sort of, uh, well, not any sort, a wide range of natural processing problems. Any problem where you have a sequence of inputs, i.e. text, uh, uh, words in the vocabulary, in this case, to another sequence, maybe labels for these words. In this case, we're going to have text that's coming in from a given vocabulary from a single language, and then another text is going to be outputted in this loop, and this is going to be outputted in some other sequence. Another sequence that a vocab is going to be outputted in another language. And uh, hopefully, anyone here with any varying skill level, and I know some of us here are freshmen, some of us here are working in the industry, some of us here have our taken courses in AI, some of us have So, my hope is that anyone here uh, will be able to get something out of this. Uh, that's the way I'm going to do this. So, it's going to be technical at some points, not technical at some points, high level, not high level. Um, but more specifically, what I'm talking about is not to be exhaustive, so I'm going to keep it broad. Uh, it's not going to be demonstrating state of the art techniques, so what I'm going to be talking about mainly was a framework developed in 2014 that then was then implemented, and then uh, some technical points that have been consistent with my discipline and some of the discipline. Uh, so the big thing is that if you have any questions, if there's anything, please stop, interrupt, that's not rude. And then there's food in the back, if there's not drinks. At any point, please go back and um, grab some. So, what's the problem? The problem is, given text in some language one, and then text in some language two, how can we estimate some sort of function, some sort of model? 
model, they can take in that text from that first language and then be able to translate that text into the second language while retaining some, the, the, while retaining the text, the text same semantic meaning, while at the same time uh, having being able to have humans succeed in this like, proper translation of the text. So this is a very difficult problem, right? Uh, you might think of some naive ways to do this, like we'll just write and be like, I'm very like we'll just have each other like pi or something like this, right? Uh, but this is of course going to capture all of the all the difficulties that emerge from these things translation. And this kind of gives you like a little brief timeline of uh, how these actually fields have developed over the years. So originally, it really did start out with these rule based systems, right? Tons and tons of rules, hyper spec, hyper specialized for you know given length of character, let's say English, French. You'd have tons and tons of rules about ways to translate certain phrases from English to French. Sort of this has developed into the example based systems, which were largely built on this, but they didn't generalize. You couldn't pick two arbitrary languages and then be able to go in and create a um, system that was invariant to um, the individual vocabulary, say, in the language it was being performed translation. What I'm presenting to you today, I'll be using the example of English and French, but given any two language pairs, it is able to actually estimate a function that can translate between those two languages. So this is kind of a more broad general pair. This is why this kind of thing you know, blew up and why you're able to have one single box that can then go translate into like, you know, hundreds of different languages. And uh, so yeah, this is like my marker of 2015 problems. So uh, some preliminaries. I uh, want to make sure we're all the same sort of uh, grounding when we're talking about some of these words. Uh, so a token, we're going to define that as a, an element of vocabulary. It's really big enough to use a lexicon, right? The word high would be a good token in that lexicon. Uh, and for simplicity, like let's say you have a sentence, right? You can go in and split that sentence into, let's say, a sequence of words. Um, so a token embedding, right? This is just going to be a, some representation of our token where we can actually put it into some uh, including soups. So for instance, a naive one is that it can say you have a vocabulary of five tokens, right? Maybe the sentence, the girl walks the dog, right? We can describe the word the uniquely with a vector with a one in the first position and a zero in all the other positions, and so forth for all the other vectors. And this is nice because what you get here is uh, you have some way of differentiating what every token you're looking at. Um, if you were just, for instance, to assign a single number to this, then you were to find there's a sort of relatedness between, you know, the number, the word that corresponds to number one and the word that corresponds to number two, and so forth. Here you have that the uh, representations form a basis, and so the distances between these two tokens <coughs> they find that there's no relationship between these words. Um, but of course, uh, this is huge, right? Usually, vocabulary you don't have five tokens in them; you'll have hundreds of thousands, right? And so, for to represent a single word. So this becomes somewhat practical, and of course this makes the assumption that there's no relationship between any two given words, right? And so a really hot research area, and I'm not going to go into this, I'm just going to uh, kind of breeze through it, is that uh, a really hot area is how can we incorporate actual context uh, when uh, representing these words. But for our purposes, we just assume, you know, when you think about, uh, when I say the word embedding, you just think about a one hot representation of a word, and what they're trying to do. So, a token sequence, this is what we're actually going to use to describe text. So we're going to say text is just simply a sequence of tokens. And that sequence of tokens, when viewed as a sequence of embeddings, you can use a matrix. So, and I say matrix in quotes here, because it's really not, uh, uh, obviously, those uh, are all not uh, linearly, linearly independent because the word the if it occurs twice in your sequence, right, without the same person in the beginning. But what we'll be able to do here is then, then go in and construct an indicator, matrix, that goes straight into our vocabulary, and then we're able to uniquely identify a given sentence, so a given sequence of text, with some abstract representation that we can then do computation. And this is what everything sets us up. So that's sort of the uh, high level there. So now we kind of have the idea, so we have this idea of a token, a sequence of tokens, we can go out and find where does it actually translate. So a translation is simply a, a, a translation, simply a function that we can take and map a given sequence of tokens from one vocabulary to a given sequence of tokens to another. So really what this means is that we're able to take any arbitrary sequence of any arbitrary length, here I'm using uh, a t, uh, to any sequence of arbitrary length t prime, and be able to transform this one matrix, right, of the representations, to another matrix to produce representations that correspond to the token indices that the, the language is built on, right? So um, this kind of gives it a more uh, uh, cemented foundation, right? So and then our goal becomes, how can we get some sort of function that can produce this thing? So, uh, the machine translation is that, hey, if we have a set of data examples, right, how can we use these, how can we leverage these set of data examples of sentences from one language to another language, right? 
and then go in and estimate a model that is able to do the control. Uh, yeah. Is there any questions at this point? I'm going to pause real quick. This is the stuff everything that falls into one. Anyone? Everyone? Anything cool? So, how do we go about estimating such a model? How do we go about an estimating such a model that's able to parameterize all these various you know, individual translation functions? upon arbitrary sequence length. So any any arbitrary input length, so input length of tokens that comes in from with respect to one vocabulary, let's say D1 of a single language, and then be able to output another sequence of token in another language, right, that uh, humans can concede you know, is a valid translation from this language to another language, uh, captures you know, maybe the same meaning, and so on and so forth. So what are some properties we want this sort of model to have, right? Obviously we want to have it be independent, right? So we want this model to be able to learn or generalized, with res not, not with respect to a given language here, but any arbitrary language variable. It means that rules aren't going to cut, right? We, we can write rules for transfer translating into different languages. That's not going to generalize to another group. And the sort of same idea, handling arbitrary long translations, and be able to, more importantly, once you've given it a bunch of examples, once you've somehow been able to learn a set of parameters which can perform these transformations between a matrix that represents the input sequence and the matrix an output sequence, anytime an input, anytime an input comes in that exists in a, uh, anytime an input comes in that's a, or that's a sentence, right, that is not, that we haven't seen before, we should be able to capture the correct translation that comes out. So this might be the idea that I've, uh, it seems obvious, but putting in this more of a firm grounding uh, makes the machinery that we're about to introduce uh, work. So uh, this kind of gives you an idea of this uh, uh, example-based translation, right? Uh, I'm going to the theater, uh, Bad German to try to pronounce that, and then I'm going to the cinema and uh, the same principles that we did in English, just simply transposing the word and get it out. This is, this is an example of something that we don't want. We don't want something that's uh, confined to a sort of limit to a given language that we use. So, the way we're going to solve this is by making up a couple of assumptions. So we're going to make kind of a few assumptions there, and the assumption very much is that the next token that comes in our output sequence is only dependent on everything we've seen before, which is not necessarily something that is, let's say, a bad assumption. Uh, you could, you know, when you speak, right, you, were, you can say that you're only speaking uh, based on everything you've said before. And this assumption we're actually going to see is A, going to be able to allow us to then perform this parameterization uh, through this, this whole idea of uh, using your recurrent and all that work. Uh, and it will also allow us to then be able to actually sample to do uh, inference. With this kind of whole idea is that what we want to do is that this conditional, we're going to go ahead and factorize it with respect to this autoregressive uh, product matrix. 
When I say autoregressive, this just means that all we care about is all the information that we've previously seen to make some sort of estimate about what will be the safe and secure outcome. So and why conditional estimation? Uh, well, as Gib said, and why can't we factorize the existing assumption that these uh, edges have escaped? The only thing that matters at one given point is that everything is escaped. So this kind of uh, gets down into the details now. Uh, how do we actually go about estimating this? Um, and this is actually quite a little bit more that's bouncing back and forth. Um, and we go about estimating this by making a mountain of assumptions about uh, the object that we're dealing with here. So uh, this is kind of like an abstract little uh, uh, formula that you can think here, right? But uh, the really the assumptions are that we can parameterize this formula with something called a uh, recurrent neural network, and uh, that we have various quick process investigation errors. Um, and what the rest of this talk is going to be about is just a very high level description about what that recurrent network is actually doing to be able to estimate this uh, term that we see here. And then you'll see a couple examples of um, how, that, that, how that actually plays out for these linear trains and what this thing is able to be able to, is able to be cool for at any given time. And uh, so for instance, another one that's used for instance, is like padding, which is this idea of padding. Uh, so when you're training this, you want to be able to give some sort of signal to whatever model that you're trying to train that uh, sequence is starting, its sequence is ending, so on and so forth. Because remember that it's arbitrary. Dealing with our arbitrary length of the parameters. So, uh, and this is, of course, just like a broad, uh, we call this a general technique for mapping an input sequence to a same length output sequence. Uh, so, of course, it doesn't directly kind of work with our framework that we're talking about here, mapping an arbitrary length input sequence to an arbitrary length output sequence, but it's sort of there. Uh, and our, our input sequences are usually these elements with RD. What this RD means is you think of it, you think of it as a, a token in your vocabulary. So uh, a, a sequence, uh, rather a, uh, uh, a unique representation of, let's say, a, a single thing. So a one followed by like a zero, the, 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 the dot that we saw previously. So, and to kind of give you an idea of uh, what this really means, so if anyone who's seen, who's been in the AI course, uh, you should be able to kind of put some graph onto what this object is. This is really a type of deep board neural network that has connections being bottlenecked with different layers. And um, uh, essentially, there's hints provided as to the coral structure of the data. Um, so that's kind of the high level graph right there. And uh, the way this kind of looks like, yes, please. What did you mean by bottleneck? Bottleneck meaning that, for instance, what you've seen traditionally, right, is that, uh, or at least here in the AI course, right? Yeah, okay. You've seen these like uh, speed forward multi layer percentage funds, right? Where every single layer is fully connected to every bottleneck. Yes. A bottleneck means there's uh, bottlenecks between the connections. So all the layers are, let's say, completely connected. So there's a limitation on the number of, on the degree of each. Um, uh, it's it's a little more complex. Though. It's a little more complex. I'll get into that in a second, actually. Okay. But there's still a lot. So uh, and the way this sort of object kind of looks like is you can think of it at the high level of a black box, right? The input comes in this, these embedded yeah. representations uh, to the sequence of tokens. It's able to go in and perform processing that are able to run these representations through a. Transformation mm -hmm. and that transformation that we can then estimate the various algorithms from uh, for all the uh, And the kind of goal that we're going to have is that how can we go about actually estimating that probability distribution using this sort of stuff? Uh, so we're going to do this um, here. And just to give an idea with this little green box you're seeing here, this recurrent neural network. And I promise this is, this is as depth as it starts to get. Um, <laughs> after that, it's all going to be. I know that's theoretically a sign of a longer path, so I'm sorry. Um, so at each time step, what's going on, and you could have done this map for now, is that you're just applying this learnable transformation. And when I see learnable here is that these W's here that you're seeing are these things called perceptrons. So this is a layer of different perceptrons. This is kind of answering Darren's question of what, what, is, what is actually going on here. This is, of course, um, um, layers of perceptrons, which are uh, you're able to estimate the parameters via uh, something called the gradient descent. Um, and it's a little more complicated because you have this recurrent structure, so you have a little more complicated version of gradient descent. Um, but the whole idea is that this is the iteration that's applied to every input that comes in. So let's say you have an input token. An input token can be embedded into uh, something that makes it say, say one hop tokenization. And then that's that X of T term you see right here. A transformation is applied to that. There is an internal state that's maintained here that's passed between, it's kind of like you can think of it as the memory between each cell you notice here at each state, right, you get an input, an x of t, this is your input at the beginning step, 
and then you have a memory curve that's going on. This is kind of at the same distance. And what's actually going on here is that this is the, these are the actual parameters, but then when a new token comes in, those parameters is going to be uh, that a token is run through those parameters, and then an output is generated, and then that output can be tuned to satisfy some objective that we want to arbitrarily impose on. Our objective is going to be we want to uh, maximize that uh, probability score, that, that probability score. Um, and these weights here are just things as perceptrons per uh, And they can be trained. Uh, what I mean by trained here is that if we have some objective, so here we have some, let's say, two parameters, right? So these would be W's right here. So if these W's say it was in two dimensions, right? Every single point on this curve that you're seeing corresponds to a, uh, let's say, if W had two, if w had two dimensions, so that hidden say H there was two. If this, a given point on this curve corresponds to a configuration of the parameters, right? And what's happening here is that based on our objective, we can minimize, we can, we can find a state of those parameters that when the input goes in, our token flow in, for instance, those, um, uh, we can get a value of our objective that we want. So that it is, let's say, this probability that comes out that uh, satisfies the objective. Uh, again, all the way. So, all right, back to reality here. Uh, so this kind of whole idea that these recurrent neural elements can be applied to temporal problems uh, where the inputs and outputs are the same length. So let's say you have an input of tokens that are coming in, let's say you want to do like a tag attack. You want to assign some different labels to each of these tokens. And what these cells allow you to do is that it, they allow you to incorporate some sort of memory in between uh, every token in the given sequence. So that way the uh, internal state of this uh, cell, so these, these, that big W in the cell, those weights, they're aware of the previous um, inputs that were given to it. And this then allows you to do some things like contextual, contextualized tagging in a given, uh, for a given sequence. Our problem is that since we machine translation, these kind of setups start to get a little more complicated because you have an arbitrary input to an arbitrarily linked output. Uh, and the solution here, introduced in uh, 2014, was this whole idea of using like couple recurrent neural networks. So, when I say recurrent neural network is again just think of something that can arbitrarily map an input sequence to an output sequence. And this whole idea of using when I say couple is that you use one to encode a representation of an input sequence. So that is we're going to go ahead and encode a representation of our text into one single language into a fixed dimensional vector. And then we're going to use that representation as input to another recurrent neural network with a different set of parameters than the original one that we used to encoding. And then go in and step by step perform the decoding process. And then during training, we're going to actually attempt to uh, optimize our given objective, which is matching this probability distribution. Um, and so now that's what I said, I was there. And uh, then we can go ahead and what I mentioned here, auto aggressively decode. decode. What this means is that if we're able to create an estimate that is uh, maximal for a given language pair, so given a set of training examples, so a sentence from one language, uh, given a, a large amount of training examples where you have sentences from one language with the correct translation in the other, we can estimate this function, and then given a token from the second language, you can condition it on the input from the original language, so your input uh, string, your input text can introduce the first language. All the, tra all the tokens you translated up to that point, and then you can figure out what is the highest probability token that will occur next. And then you can keep sampling that as you build your app, as you build this out. All right, so now it's all just pictures. So the kind of way this works is, again, uh, the recurrent neural network. So this, each of these cells, this RNN sub one, right? This is a single setup of the parameters. So this is a little bit, how do you say, um, this is a little bit, how do you say, lying when you, have, when you see these cells multiple times. Because this is all one set of parameters, right? That are just being applied in sequence over top of the inputs, right? And this is how you have really get that memory being retained. So that, you know, this uh, H sub two is, when, you're, when it puts in, when it puts in that X sub three into that cell, right? It's able to retain information about all the previous um, inputs that were given X. Um, so the whole, whole entire idea of this encoder decoder framework is that we run that that one given recurrent neural network cell over top of our whole input sequence of our given language. That generates that hidden state, right? That hidden state being those um, that 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 output there that was created by the multiplication of W's that we found, the, weight, the weights of our, of our cell. Those are, the, those are those points in that high dimensional graph that we found that we found. And what that does is then we can use that representation as an initialization 
for a second network. Uh, this is a different set of weights that you can pay. This a different set of a different this one takes a different set of parameters, and then that will allow us with the appropriate um, with the appropriate transformation being applied to our output to be able to actually estimate this as well. So and then we can go through and use auto aggressive iterate. So at every given step, what we have here is that we had that input that came that deep, that encoded representation from our first recurrent neural network, coupled with the input that we just saw, um, so at the beginning of step with weight is equal to 75 to yes, sort of marker that one that marks this is the beginning of our new translation. Uh, this then provides you, this, so this is this kind of first term in our fact, in our, in our factorized, um, in that, that big product we saw. This then provides you a way of estimating what is the next, what is the next most likely token given everything that we've seen before. And then this is kind of, then this second network can be unfolded over top, and then fed in the input of what it previously produced. So for instance, here let's say it produces this law. That law is then fed in as the input, again to itself, coupled with the representation that you got from the first RMN, and then out you get this sort of unregressive manner, and then you can produce the output translation. So at the high level, this is how these encoder decoder recurrent networks are created. So, uh, and this is sort of what I'm saying, that this is parameterizing our distribution in our set, in the sense that what we get here is that each of these terms is a term in this plot. And so on and so forth. So, uh, and with the right constraints and with the right uh, setup on the output, what you get is that uh, you're able to actually go in and practice this in this work really well. Uh, we can see this sort of stuff is that each of these uh, elements here, right, these are things x1, x2, um, so on and so forth. Each of these are high dimensional things. Uh, so, like, it looks like it's kind of going token by token. So, like, in one of hypothetical things, I would say things, if you say English, that's like five characters, you translate it to say French, and it's like six tokens. How do you come to that extra token? Uh, well, so this is the whole point. So, maybe I should make this more clear. Is that when you go out, so say you have this distribution estimator already, right? All we know is that at one given point, the probability of a token given everything that we've seen before, right? So, the way that you go in and actually sample this, is that, let's say we have, we start out with this BOS, right? So we have context that comes in from our first encoder. That context, coupled with that beginning of sentence input, is then utilized to transform our first output. That is, it is able to assign for every single token in our V2 vocabulary a probability score. We pick the one that, max, we pick the token that maximizes that probability score and use it as input into those same weights coupled again with our encoded representation of our first, first encoder. And then we can recursively apply that all the way until we generate a end of sentence token. Does that to what you're saying there? So this is this is this whole this whole this all this whole idea, this whole problem of having a variable length input and a variable length output. idea is that I talked mainly about, I kind of showcased how inference works to one of these things. Training is a little bit more complicated, um, but the whole idea is that uh, they're able to capture and parameterize this distribution that we saw, and then we can do the actual translation for the actual decoding in the second language via sampling first. So, uh, well, how well does this work? Good question. This works really well. Uh, so in 2014 was actually the first time we were able to get these generalized systems, so this kind of encoder decoder framework. Uh, use lies um, concept that's a little more complicated than just these single RNN cells, but this is the first time where you're able to actually match these phrase-based and statistical-based translation benchmarks, right? Only using examples of input sentences and output sentences in, in, in your two languages. So you had no given rules. So there was no input of you know these are our known translations of given words from one language to another language. It was completely able to just leverage data, just representations of tokens from two different vocabulary to two languages and actually estimate this probability distribution and then be able to perform decoding like I, like I showed you uh, arbitrarily with no input from the actual human. Uh, and all of the, how do you say, uh, uh, knowledge of how this is actually happening is coupled up with those weights there that are then uh, learned and adjusted based via a uh, couple of uh, techniques for uh, optimizing our objectives and what we're able to maximize that uh, probability of the actual uh, that's 
that. And just to give you an idea of like, what this actually entails, in this actual data set that they were using here are 12 million, million examples of um, uh, sentences in English, then output sentences in uh, sentences in English and French, uh, W and Russian caps. Um, so 12 million examples. So for every single example, right, what this meant is that you go in and represent it in, in a, uh, you, you represent each of these sequences, you run it through this model, it produces a given output, and then that output is uh, quote unquote trained to um, comply with our objective that we, that we want to set. Um, and so it had 348 million parameters, it was a couple of gigabytes on disk, <laughs> this thing was huge. When they actually went in to first develop it, they didn't have all the modern day hardware that people work with now for this stuff. Like, you can represent this kind of stuff on a single, uh, on a single large enough GPU, not like this, this, this actual model. What they had is they actually went in, and the guy who implemented this is actually currently the research director at OpenAI, which is working with Swiss, Swiss, Swiss for the original work. Um, they actually took this and distributed it not only at the data level, so that it's having copies of, of, of the model during training on different GPUs, they actually had the model weights interlinked between so every time during training when you're trying to do an update of the parameters, you actually had to have the GPUs communicate in between the actual weights that were stored on them. So this is something that you don't really see nowadays because of how crazy uh, big uh, RAM that these devices have. Um, but uh, this thing is huge. Um, but, um, uh, but it worked really well. So, and kind of how it's performing, so this, I guess this is something I also obviously need to cover. Uh, this whole idea of how do you even evaluate this? How, how does a computer objectively say this translation is a good enough translation? Um, so there's this metric called blue, um, well, finally blue, uh, which you never study. Uh, essentially, it's a metric of how similar a uh, output translation is to a known human translation, um, and it has high, very high correlation with human judgment. Um, so this is like the standard metric in this uh, machine translation company that people utilize, um, and so this. The score of this model was about on par with the current methods of the day, these phrase-based translation methods. Uh, so this was about 35% blue, which is very, very, very good. Um, and that was like the first time where we were able to get a completely unsupervised system like this. Uh, the current state of the art today sits at about 45. Uh, things have improved a lot. And what I mean they improved a lot is that everything I just showed you is actually nonsense. Because that's not how any of this originally worked. That's the kind of the high level, oh, so not everything. Uh, the encoder decoder framework is exactly the same. Uh, all of that, all of that is exactly the same, except recurrent neural network cells have a lot of actual problems that they, you, they can't allow you to uh, apply them to these sort of tasks. Uh, so there's a lot of spectral analysis you can actually do on the transformations that, that they uh, embody that will tell you um, about basically they, they, they the high level they forget things that they see in the past, which is something you don't want when you're trying to parameterize. Um, and so this this other uh, more highly parameterized cell essentially the encoder is when these when these there's more highly parameterized things it has more weights and different connections between them so it's not even a mess. Um, uh, another kind of point that they had is that they actually found this is kind of interesting when training these things uh, they were able to actually get better performance if they reversed the output uh, sequence during training. So kind of the idea here was that you were having a shorter distance between the connections that were coming in. Uh, when you were generating the output. So instead of the girl went to the park and then the French equivalent of that, we would have the girl went to the park and then the reversed of the French equivalent of that during training. And then when you were actually decoding, you were decoding a reversed uh, version of what the actual translation was and then obviously you just reverse that. And they were actually able to get about 10% boot improvements just from uh, going in and, and getting that boot So that was really interesting. Um, and of course, so I told you recently that the vocabulary that they utilize here, right, was 140,000 tokens, right? That means each of those input vectors, x and t, that was coming in, right, was 140,000 dimensions. And that was the input space, right, and the output space had 80,000 dimensions. Uh, and that's, first of all, not actually how it's done uh, nowadays. Um, we utilize these more, uh, let's say, attuned representations of text that are actually outputs of another neural network that we train in with word embeddings, um, and even more stuff that's developed recently. But this whole idea that the larger your vocabulary you have, just the more difficult it is to be able to work with it. There's uh, other stuff that's come out recently that allows you to actually train a tokenization model, as opposed to going in and breaking up your tokens 
cases, you can actually train a model that will synchronize text for you and then that information is used for us. Um, it's actually pretty close to what's actually being done with the open source of training. And then uh, what I was sort of saying, that actually RNN based architectures, so the RNNs and LSTMs, aren't actually even utilized for machine translation nowadays. Uh, these things uh, have this problem where the recurrent part of the recurrent neural network makes the training really hard. Uh, because what essentially what you're doing is you're layering these um, to make sense. What at the end it looks like a multi-layer perceptron, uh, so a layer of a bunch of layers of recurrent neural networks, right? Which what you think of when you think of recurrent neural network, uh, rather what you think of when you think of neural network. And training them is difficult because at each point you have to essentially do the number of updates that have always been received. So there's newer models today that don't require recurrence, um, and uh, they work really well. But of course, they're highly time intensive. And the general theme has recently. And then that condensed representation of an input sequence can be gone and gone in and utilized to then generate an output sequence um, that can then match our data link transition. So this is the actual framework that is utilized in data link visualization systems, coupled with, of course, these rule based systems that work really well or are in fact testable for in practice. So just to give you this kind of high level idea of what's going on, I know I went into the technical details at different points. I try to remember as well as I don't remember, but I hope everyone was at least gave to get an idea of uh, what's actually going on with some of the question translation um, and the high level. Yeah. Thank you guys. Are there any questions? Yeah. yeah uh, so you uh, talked at the end that there are some more advanced like tokenizers that uh, yeah. Google has been like implementing. Uh, would those more advanced tokenizers be doing stuff like French does this all the time, where they just like smush a bunch of words together and so figure out how to So what them those apart. are actually doing, so they're actually training these things called language models to actually pick how to best, so you have text that comes from a given domain, right? So what these things do is then break up the text into its individual characters, and then train a language model that goes in and actually goes in and merges them together, and then tries to do this thing called uh, maximizing, um, rather, okay, I'm actually not sure that part, I'm not gonna say it. Um, what essentially it builds up token tokenizations of a given language based on combinations of characters. So that a given, for instance, a given word in that tokenization might actually be like ATH or something like this. And that just for the given domain of text was the thing that was able to occur, the, that was distributionally the most, um, as determined by the given model that was trained, a good token to be able to include uh, in a single data in, but still the vocabulary tries to Essentially what this all, is, all, all ends up doing is that words that occur, strings of characters that occur most, right, go in and um, are represented in a synchronization, not with respect to like spacing. Um, this makes the vocabulary more difficult and so on. Uh, and I did include an appendix here. Uh, this is what the actual model looked like in the 2014 one. So not only did you have a single layer, um, you had that single current level that in your encoder, you actually had the outputs were linked to the previous inputs. <laughs> Of the uh, of, of the previous layer, so you actually had eight unique uh, LSTM cells, which are a type of current neural networks, each with their own parameters during training. Uh, so these things were introduced. That's why when I said uh, 340 million parameters, 340 million parameters were defined by these things. Uh, and then these things, each themselves contain multiple, multiple uh, layers of perceptrons that are linked in various ways. So these things are very complicated, but uh, the whole kind of whole idea was these things exist. These things are solving real world problems. You guys ever heard of name recognition in ER? Uh, this, these same sort of models just are able to actually pass these along. But uh, it doesn't just have to be text. Uh, anytime you have any sort of input signal that goes in, and you have some sort of input signal that comes out, whether that's maybe some information about a stock at a given point in time, right? These actual same models are able to capture that kind of information and make uh, these kind of representations. So, uh, yeah. I know another, another kind of interesting case before I move on to off is this. Uh, if the input language and the output language are actually the same, uh, and then you actually utilize this to train a next sentence prediction task, you can actually get a model, an encoder, 
that is able to actually capture information about a language, so that when you go and put in tokens, the output that it produces are actually already, how do you say, um, kind of pre-trained representations for a good enough language. So essentially, instead of doing machine translation from one language to another, try to do machine translation from one language to itself, where you utilize a large corpus of text, and then you go ahead and do predictions. Have you ever heard about things like BERT or ELMO, these like large language models? This is what actually this game is like all about, sort of at the high level, so that was um, But yeah, so uh, I hope uh, any of the audience who actually knows stuff about this didn't cringe too much as I was talking. Uh, and yeah, thank you.